I'm very pleased to have a guest expert today. Lisa Nazaric, who, was, uh, who, who did her master's degree in philosophy, actually, political, political philosophy in, in, at the American University of Paris, and she's currently finishing her PhD at the École du Normal Supérieur de Paris in the philosophy department, which is one of Europe's premier, actually, uh, philosophy departments. And uh, 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 Zona's thesis is, although there's a, it's a provisional title, huh? It's a provisional title is, uh, um, is? It is the political significance of compassion. Political significance of compassion. Okay, so Zona is a cosmopolitan theorist and working from cosmopolitan perspectives. And uh, uh, has actually has actually an original approach to the question of culture and politics. This means she has been. I think this is this is interesting. I mentioned she has been running a seminar at the Economia, a weekly seminar, along with other doctoral students and some professors on care and compassion in the hospital. And this the the seminar is actually occurring in a hospital. So it's about it's about the linkage between you know care and compassion and hospital treatment and more broad, broader philosophical issues. These are extraordinarily interesting seminars that you can go to. It's best if you speak French, of course. And there are a couple of English speakers there, but it's best if you speak French. There, it's, it's, extremely, it's an extremely rich seminar with all kinds of different uh, uh, invitees from the social sciences, from medicine, from philosophy. So that's at the Hotel Dieu. It's uh, two Thursdays a month. Uh, if you Google Soir et Compassion, you can get the website and see the guest speakers, the topic that interests you. I think it actually might be of interest. Some, some of you just look at what, you know, what seminars might be of interest to you. Huh? Voila, so uh, <coughs> Zona Zaritz is going to be speaking today about, about her philosophical project and about cosmopolitanism. You have to take and receive the type of uh, on the floor is yours. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. I know it's a stressful week, a couple of weeks left. <laughs> I've sent you some readings. I don't know if you've had the time to look at them. But um, it was just to uh, make today more fun and so that we could have maybe a debate if you have some questions to leave some time at the end to help you think through things maybe differently. And um, I was invited asked to talk to you today um, about cosmopolitanism, but also through the specter of the current refugee crisis and through the, through the prism of my work and my uh, thesis that Professor Golub told you a little bit about. So um, the two readings I've given you by, are by two contemporary prominent American philosophers. Well, uh, Apia isn't really American, but lives there currently. Uh, and as he says, we all have uh, multiple uh, belongings and identities we can choose. So he is actually, his mother is British and his father from Ghana. But he currently lives in America and uh, has been awarded just recently the award of the great immigrant. And Martha Nussbaum, as some of you might know, is the professor at the University of Chicago. And she specializes in cosmopolitanism, as an expert in Aristotle and moral emotions. And uh, I sent you a chapter from her book, For Love of Country. And I think it's an interesting book. It's actually a collection of articles that discuss um, different belongings and whether they can exist together. So whether you can be a good patriot and be a good uh, citizen of the world at the same time and questions like that in a very approachable manner from uh, thinkers such as Apia, uh, Benjamin Barber, Michael Walzer, Amartya Sen. So I'm sure you've mentioned some of these names in this class before. So um, wrapping up a class, uh, a semester on cosmopolitanism seems to me always uh, ending it on a positive note, on uh, proposing a framework for thinking or a, a personal conviction uh, that opens up to new possibilities that always tends to surpass the status quo. So cosmopolitanism uh, could be even thought of in a globalized world that we live in today as a new realism, as something that is inevitable, and I'll get to that uh, through my lecture. 
but uh, to begin just with a little bit of uh, context for cosmopolitanism, so I've said it's a theoretical framework that focuses on the connections that people feel as citizens of the world and the role of ethics in world politics. So um, where once the dominant paradigm of international relations succeeded in the effective exclusion of the ethical from the world politics, either by asserting a difference between domestic order and international anarchy, or by deferring questions of ethics until an international community is achieved. Nowadays, um, in academic um, communities, but as well as in policy, is in NGOs, in uh, international organizations, in increased attention is given to cosmopolitanism as a normative framework for addressing world politics today. And uh, for obvious obvious reasons, we will, I will get to that. But as I'm sure you've uh, discussed in the class, the nature of social contract and um, the, the nation states, and then the lack of the same kind of um, organization on an international level, which we used to refer in this class as um, anarchy in an international level. But there are more and more forms of organizing um, relationships between states without actually uh, aiming for a global state, because that is not, or rarely in some forms of cosmopolitanism, but not the one I'm espousing, what cosmopolitanism seeks. So uh, it is, to say it very simply, a necessary response to a recently extremely globalized world order and a global crisis that uh, is more and more eminent, like the environmental one we are facing. And um, so we would expect that this increase in globalization would increase openness in the political climate, but as evident in the recent rise of far-right politics and populism, it unfortunately isn't the case. Um, my belief is it's because cosmopolitanism is rarely fully practiced or uh, taken seriously as it should be. So to, to begin with, uh, the first person who was referred to as a cosmopolitan or declared himself as such was uh, Diogenes, and this was four century, in the 4th century B BC. So why is this interesting uh, to me today is that uh, at that time, uh, Diogenes imagined himself as a citizen of the world where he had no actual knowledge of the rest of the world or ways in which he could affect the rest of the world. So cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism comes from cosmos, which means the world as a whole, and, and polis, which is a, the polity, a self-governing political entity. So he imagined belonging um, to that kind of, th that being his um, primer, uh, primary belonging. And he uh, did not have the means that we have today of uh, seeing uh, life in every part of the world with uh, media uh, and um, w ways in which we can today uh, realistically imagine contacting anybody of the seven million, um, billion, billion, sorry, seven billion um, fellow uh, citizens of the world. So we can realistically imagine contacting, sending something, uh, changing the life of someone in whatever part of the world, whereas uh, in his time that was just a metaphor. And a metaphor, of course, because uh, citizens form a state, and there was no world state, and then there isn't any even today. But interpreting this metaphor is what is of extreme importance, and this is what uh, Apia argues. This is the other book I've talked about, I've uh, sent you apart from, which is Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers. Also very readable. He is known for um, making technical parts of philosophy uh, pertinent to uh, current world problems. So, so is this book, and he also talks about uh, personal convictions and how he came to be through his family, a cosmopolitan. So the way Apia interprets this metaphor is um, in three ways. First one is that we do not need a single world government. Uh, I will get to that. Second one, that caring for the fate of all human beings, whether inside or outside of our own societies, is of extreme impor importance. And last, um, that we have much to gain through different conversations that we can have uh, today and from the differences that, that we will encounter through that conversation. So um, Apia explains that uh, the historical context of the philosophical resurgence of cosmopolitanism happened uh, during the Enlightenment, and uh, that 
That is due to many different reasons. So the increasing rise of capitalism and worldwide trade and its theoretical reflections, the reality of the ever-expanding empires whose reach extended across the globe, the voyages around the world, and the anthropological so-called discoveries that facilitated through that were facilitated through these. So then, after the emergence of a notion of human rights and um, a philosophical focus on human reason. And with the expansion of empire uh, came the expansion of what was considered as universal. Uh, so if you look at it through the context, uh, a content, uh, context of Marcus Aurelius, um, who believed in kinship um, of world citizenship, in world, in world citizenship, and if you think of uh, what was considered uh, to be universal before uh, the expansion of empire and voyages and what is considered to be universal human value and human dignity now, you will see that it's a vast expanding uh, circle. And so in the last 50 years, the world community has created global institutions and uh, formed agreements um, to better address this as a part of what I see as a cosmopolitan project. So we have Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, Human Rights, and we will, uh, after the World War II, seen the creation of the United Nations, which was formed to so that countries can support each other in the quest for international peace and security, economic development, and most importantly, to cultivate universal human rights. Consequently, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted to ensure ba basic human um, rights, and the International Criminal Tribunal, which was instituted to make states more accountable for their crimes against humanity. So. All of these international uh, efforts are uh, so in some way organizing the anarchy that exists between states, but again, not uh, aiming towards a global state. Um, and um, moral philosophers and moralists in uh, the wake of the 18th century, uh, that, uh, th that wave of cosmopolitanism insisted that we human beings have a duty to aid fellow humans in need regardless of their citizenship status. So there is a history of international relief of, uh, efforts like the Red Cross or uh, many organizations uh, to, that help relieve famine, that bring health care. Um, in the name of the reduction of human suffering and without regard to the nationality of those affected to protect and serve the vulnerable people regardless um, of, of country. So all of these efforts uh, obviously stem from something. They stem from convictions that uh, we have one universal belonging and that is our shared uh, finitude, our shared mortality. That no matter our different belongings, uh, one thing is inevitable, that is that we are all vulnerable and mor mortal, and that uh, being affected by the vulnerability of another human being creates an obligation in us to do something about it. So whether on an individual level, institutional level, state level, uh, efforts have been made and are still being made. Uh, we've uh, seen the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Paris Agreement to fight climate change, uh, just uh, to name some, and a very important work that maybe you have mentioned in this class by Immanuel Kant uh, towards perpetual peace. Um, is even believed to be uh, the founding structure of the League of Nations and was a serious effort towards uh, world peace and organizing uh, world order uh, with, with that in mind. So um, now after the end of the Cold War and again the resurgence of the discussion about the most appropriate world order to promote global peace just as uh, there was after the First and the Second World War that we just mentioned, uh, there's, a, again, a requirement for justice that surpasses uh, national boundaries. And today, um, in a world that uh, witnesses the largest number of people on the move, the migration and refugee crisis uh, is of particular salience to thinking cosmopolitanism today. Um, 
we uh, we need these motivations uh, to, to help us inhabit a realm beyond our own particular nations because we see the nation response is insufficient to these problems and because again we live in a world where human lives are increasingly <coughs> interdependent digital technologies allow us to see each other uh, to contact each other to change each other's lives in uh, in a significant uh, way so thinking the individual in an era of globalization in my opinion is impossible without the thinking through a cosmopolitan framework. Uh, the, the existence of global media means already that we know about one another and that the excuse of not knowing about human suffering in another part of the world is no longer a valid excuse. And uh, as well, interconnections that exist politically, militarily, ecologically means we can and we do affect one another. So not choosing not to think about those consequences and still choosing um, the national boundary as the only uh, framework for thought, as the only imaginary, is uh, extremely limiting of our potentiality as, as uh, individuals in an era of glo globalization. And Kwame Api uh, Anthony Apia writes about the importance of transcending boundaries and borders uh, in the literary sense and in this sense of imagination, of expanding our uh, imagination to, to uh, and our belongings. So uh, today we really need the spirit of cosmopolitanism that was invented two and a half millennia ago. But the challenge is how to prepare minds that have lived uh, for a long millennia in small communities with a bound imaginary and equip them with ideas and institutions that will allow us to live as the global tribe we have in a certain sense become. So um, speaking of imaginary and uh, an interesting reference might be for you, uh, a book entitled Imagined Communities by Benedict Anderson. Which is maybe an interesting first step um, to think, and um, I'll put it up here and move down. Zelman's writing is definitely better than that. <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure of that. So, um, Benedict Anderson's book, uh, Imagine Communities, uh, he actually coined that term, which is now often used, um, explains, uh, here this might be an interesting image to think about it, how we have grown to uh, love a country, love a certain geographical space or a flag or a national anthem, and how it's been a successful mobilization of our imaginary, but only uh, within that limited space. So what I think, try to think through in my thesis and expand on is how do we now uh, do the same but for a community of human beings as mortals? So the main belonging being that, that we have a duty towards humanity wherever we find it. And why is um, the question of who is the stranger, who is the other, always uh, outside of the border. So why do we create this idea that we necessarily are familiar with everybody within our nation state, but then everybody outside it is in some way a stranger or the other? Whereas uh, I'm pretty sure that all of you think that way in, in some aspects of your lives that you have much more in common with, um, as I'm sure you all have different backgrounds, so maybe an Italian with an American, uh, somebody from China with somebody from former Yugoslavia. In uh, histories we've lived personal or in preferences we have today that uh, limiting ourselves to just <coughs> saying that our duty and our understanding uh, of us is only the us that's in the, within the national border. So the challenge is to expand that imaginary, and uh, Martha Nussbaum has done a lot of beautiful work on doing that through literature, arts, theater, and she mentions how in uh, the Greek quote, it used to be done through theater, how there was an indispensable role of Greek theater in mobilizing um, uh, the, the viewer's uh, sentiment, whether it was uh, viewing a tragedy or a comedy, but understanding through viewing another person's uh, situation, the common uh, denominator, which is the vulnerability. So that uh, by living in this sense and not actually having lived an experience, we can be better equipped to respond um, 
and be moved by the suffering of another fellow human being. So in addition to moral and political forms of cosmopolitanism, there has a, uh, been another form that has emerged, uh, which is economic form of cosmopolitan theory, and uh, it is the, the freer trade advocated by, started uh, in the 18th century anti-mercantilist, especially Adam Smith, who I'm sure you've mentioned, was developed further into the ideal of global free market that we know today. So um, goods are free to move, but humans aren't, or some humans are. So the question uh, uh, is, what is it that uh, has allowed us, again, thinking it through the imaginary that we have come to accept, to think of uh, certain visitors as desirable or acceptable and certain uh, as less? So uh, why should we care, uh, Apia writes, for a Chinaman when he crosses our border and not for that same uh, person on just uh, outside of the border? So thinking, um, thinking in those terms um, runs through Greek philosophy, Christian theology, Kantian critical theory, and liberalism. And in recent decades, and due to the work of a few key scholars, cosmopolitan thinking has undergone a revival across the social sciences. And as we mentioned, it's been embodied by uh, new international by international institutions that are growing and more and more present. So the Another thing that I wanted to um, ex explain about cosmopolitanism is that even though it's about universality, it's also about difference. So it, it is about moral universality in the sense of equal moral worth of every human being and uh, not ignoring some lives as less salient and, uh, as Judith Butler would say, uh, choosing which lives we choose to protect and those that we allow to die to perish. Uh, but uh, thinking it um, in a sense of uh, a reinvented idea of democracy. So the project of cosmopolitan democracy involving the deepening of democracy within nation states and extending it across political borders. This is, in my belief, neither an optimistic nor pessimistic respect to these developments. It is just a position of advocacy needed in our times. So therefore the universality of uh, cosmopolitanism aiming to uh, alleviate suffering wherever it finds it and give equal human worth uh, to all individuals and this also um, has been um, I should say uh, improved and uh, further than human rights, basic human rights in the works of Amartya Sen and uh, Nussbaum uh, in the capabilities approach I don't know if you are familiar with the capabilities approach it is the um, explanation that even though we have officially on paper equal human rights, that that unfortunately very often might not be the case in practice. So that either access to the, these rights is uh, dependent on some powers that can either take it away from us or that we can be deprived, uh, prevented from access to them that should be an un unconditional act access. So they believe that the capabilities approach complements human rights and insists on the minimal conditions of a dignified existence. Uh, that uh, in a case of humanitarian disaster, um, let's imagine an earthquake, that even though the citizens of uh, the, the country, the territory, I like to say territory and not countries because there are only territories, countries are really only in our imaginary, uh, might have on paper the same rights that as us we do today in Paris, but they do not have the same access and the ability to actually live up to the full potential of those rights. So translating abstract rights into something more concrete, more tangible, what everyone can be, can do based on their physical, mental, social, or environmental resources was the work of Sen and Nussbaum done through um, the capabilities approach. So, um, as I've mentioned, uh, th this work, I've also mentioned the work of Martha Nussbaum on literature and the imaginary, and this is where I would take a minute or two to tell you something about my own work and how it meets uh, this context of today's class. Um, Nussbaum works as well on uh, moral emotions and the role of emotions in politics. 
and so do I with um, trying to explain uh, the differences between tolerance, sympathy, empathy, compassion, or pity, and how do those fit in the framework of, of uh, thinking a cosmopolitan world. So the reason I've chosen compassion is um, that it allows us to actually feel in the same movement uh, in us and do something about it, this common uh, humanity. So if we feel ourselves as vulnerable, if we have self-compassion, we will be better attuned to feeling compassion in the other human suffering. And if the imaginary is mobilized as uh, belonging to uh, humanity first and foremost, and then all our other belongings, then whenever we are uh, struck with another human being suffering, the compassion that is naturally an innate human feeling um, should be the best guidance to uh, to responding to it. But of course, I do not espouse that uh, dealing with today's, for example, uh, refugee crisis should be dealt only on a personal level like this, but on the contrary, that it's a big problem when the personal level becomes the only level of trying to respond when institutions fail to organize. Uh, this is where I believe it's interesting to think back in the context of social uh, context of social contract and how it is that we get used to um, institutions and laws not addressing uh, something that they were meant to be addressing. Why do not we not hold the other side of the social contract accountable? And why isn't there more of a dialogue, like Apia always stresses, between uh, the state, the institutions following individual efforts, and there have been many, to aid refugees, for example, today, and uh, giving that, uh, that movement, that individual uh, community movement, uh, political salience and valuing it. This all uh, probably has its roots in the discourse in media that is mobilized today, the discourse uh, that is unfortunately more and more as refugee as the public enemy number one, and uh, in um, increasingly um, uh, more and more uh, states oriented towards security uh, and, uh, for example, living in the times of uh, état d'urgence, uh, state, state of emergency. Uh, that there is no time uh, to to think about other things than this, and then this per perpetuates the discourse of us and them and those who we allowed through our borders and those who we don't. And um, I believe that perpetuating this discourse uh, isn't going to help us move uh, past anything, isn't going to help us address uh, definitely the, the, the refugee crisis, because they have no envisioned future in this discourse. They have no past restituted to them. They have been suspended of all rights. And um, as Hannah Arendt, which is a big read, maybe scary when you see the size of the book, but for those interested, you can look at some chapters. A very important book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. <coughs> As she warns, um, when we uh, get into a situation that we suspend rights to certain individuals, uh, we are, that's the first sign of a totalitarian state and dangers in giving more value to certain human lives and less to others. So thinking of this discourse as detrimental and trying to think of a beneficial discourse, a beneficial imaginary, and to present hospitality nowadays as uh, an unreasonable idealism instead of an appropriate advocacy response, uh, I believe only perpetuates the, the problems we are currently in. So going from a bounded a national, uh, uh, nation, imagine, uh, nation imaginary, like discussed in imagined communities, towards an unbounded cosmopolitan imaginary, uh, talking about who is actually today the distant stranger, is there such a thing? Why would uh, anybody be more distant? Uh, why would the person that belongs to your own bounded, bounded imaginary be any less distant uh, than someone in another nation? So uh, if we continue to perpetuate uh, the other discourse instead of this one and in action and we uh, end up in a world where uh, 
uh, we think of cosmopolitanism as something that can never be realized fully, it is still not the reason for us not to uh, help it exist and be propagated as a normative goal, something to tend to, uh, something that um, uh, that could become a model that will mo mobilize us to certain uh, action, something that can be done here and now. So like Apia talks about his father who never left his village, but... Uh, was fully open to the world and helped more people by st staying in a way a local cosmopolitanism, a local cosmopolitan, um, and uh, still holding on to his belongings and tra tradition. This is a realizable idea for everyone um, of cosmopolitanism and wherever encountered with the stranger uh, to not see that stranger as such, but another human being we encounter in our path. In our path. So this is a model to to bear in mind, and it's a necessary idea towards which realiza whose realization we have to tend, I believe. But of course, uh, needless to say that there will always be an open and a closed space. So we have walls with our neighbors. Uh, there are two continuums of a society. There is a wall, there is a bridge in every society. I am not, uh, I hope I'm not being understood as that there, there should be no boundaries. Boundaries will always exist, and they always play a certain role. But that shouldn't diminish uh, the idealism of hospi hospitality. On the contrary, that's the realism of hospitality, and it only comes to complement the idealism. So uh, in this way, it's not even idealistic, because it's choosing hospitality over abandon. Abandoning certain populations is has shown today, uh, has seen today, um, a path to greater risk, whereas choosing hospitality over abandon could be a much easier response, and calculating the pros and cons of thinking it through isn't abandoning idealism, it's just prolonging the sentiment, which brings me back to what I was telling you about the sentiment of compassion shouldn't be the only response uh, left for individuals, but that there should be some sort of cal calculation towards uh, understanding how we can better address a situation. So like when uh, the mayor of Paris uh, put up shelters for refugees that were unfortunately removed, that was not an uh, unreasonable nor an idealistic approach to uh, leaving otherwise people on the streets with nobody to talk to other than police, no uh, intermediary such as social workers, psychologists, and uh, this, I don't know how much time I've Sorry, taken already. So this uh, brings me back to uh, thinking uh, the current situation. This is a situation today where we are increasingly, it's just a sad thing to say, but more and more used to seeing this, seeing people in the streets not being able to do anything as an individual, our state not providing a satisfactory response, some institutions being there, but it's dissipated, it's not um, held by, by, by the state. So what happens when we are in, in a situation like this? We either end up uh, in uh, being a biaisé, uh, blasé ou biaisé? Blasé, blasé. Uh, jaded. Or to just like not For me, it's blasé. Jaded. Use, used to insensitive. insensitive and used to not responding, which uh, Judith Butler writes about, and she says even though we could have uh, you or me. Uh, all that we need for a dignified existence, that our existence could never be fully happy knowing that there are others less fortunate just by the fortune of birth into another country or a situation of war in their country that cannot live up to that same potential. So that we will always be ridden by a um, certain melancholy in our own existence knowing that this situation exists, that we are not doing enough or not able to do enough. So that is the individual level, and then there is um, the state uh, response, and uh, this, again, thinking it through the social contract, and the French historian uh, Sophie Wanik, that as a specialist of the re revolution, wrote a book called The Intelligence, the Political Intelligence of the French Revolution, where she helps, uh, well, helped me think through this in the way of redefining the idea of homeland and the nation, la patrie, as the place where we can live and love our laws, so not love the laws not by mere obedience, but love the law because we believe in it, because that was the part of the social contract, the democracy we've chosen. So what happens when we end up living in a state where we no longer love the laws and the response the state is giving? 
So she reminds us that uh, we are supposed that this, this what, what was supposed to be the necessary part of social contract and the attributes of people's sovereignty, if it's no longer the case, uh, then the, uh, by uh, by uh, entering a society that is such, that is broken, we are no longer in the situation to obey those rules, uh, rules uh, but we actually should obey, which brings me to the question of civil disobedience. I don't know if you've worked we on it. We have discussed civil disobedience. So to, to obey a higher law, which is uh, the one that stems from our belonging to the, the same humankind. And do we see that uh, today? And do we think it through the other side of the social contract uh, accountability is what she helps us think through. Um, she says that um, if the nation is in this way redefined, then by entering, uh, I'm translating her words, the book is in French, if we enter into a political friendship, so to speak, which is bound upon the love of liberty and life and laws, then whenever that is not the case and the laws become unjust, it is the whole, the collective society that is broken, uh, the co uh, social contract that is broken, and we are no longer in the situation to love the laws. This authorizes revolt, holding the other side of the social contract accountable. So a good example would be, um, for example, criminalizing solidarity, punishing certain people for having helped refugees outside of the context of what law um, There's a recent example that yeah. the, may I? The, 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 there was some, some uh, a group of, of immigrants crossed the border from Italy to France over the mountains, the Alps, under, just now, two weeks ago, under freezing conditions. And they were helped on the French side, these African refugees, who probably come from Libya. And you've all heard about the slavery business in Libya. They were helped by an association, you know, a small group of people on the French side who were actually helping refugees, helping human beings. Both were arrested. The French people who were, the French, the French nationals who were helping the refugees were arrested because they were breaking the law that you're not allowed to help Ill, quote unquote illegal immigrants, yes? And of course the refugees were arrested because they were entering into a national territory without permission to do so. So it's illegal, it's illegal, we have to think about this. It's actually illegal to help a refugee under conditions of existential distress if they're crossing the border. Yes, please go on. Then already just uh, making a human life illegal, attributing that word to human life, yes. brings me back again to the way we value lives in Judith Butler lives. And so if this is the situation we're in now, then it's a sort of, again, something I thought you, I think you've uh, learned about this semester, a Hobbesian state, a state where the other side of the social contract has all the power, and we've kind of given into by uh, just being used to not responding or made to believe that our response can never be sufficient, um, which is another uh, book I use often in my thesis. It's a French sociolog by the French sociologist Luc Boltanski and uh, the La Souffrance à Distance, Suffering at Distance. So the idea of how uh, media, news, with increasingly, um, with the increasing amount of uh, images of violence we see, even though we've never lived in a less violent world in the sense of uh, people dying in wars, uh, which seems so, so unrealistic mm -hmm. because of what we've been used to seeing in the media, but he argues that this is precisely what the, uh, is happening because of what we're viewing, that we are be, we're becoming more and more insensitive. So more and more violence on television equals less and less reaction. More and more homeless people, more and more uh, refugees, uh, puts us in a, um, a situation of seeing it just as mere numbers. The way the story is being told is a certain number of people has drowned in the ocean trying to cross, in the Mediterranean trying to cross the border, and that's it, that's the story. It's not the human life, it's not the struggle it comes from, it's not the family, the names. We are not given the time to mourn them, we are not given the thought framework to try and address this. So the, the average citizen... Uh, is just faced with a situation that seems unrealistic, that his demands or feelings of obligation of belongings can do nothing in face of this. Uh, 
whereas I believe it's all a shift of representation, so a shift in media discourse, in images, in, um, in mobilizing a different imaginary, in uh, reading different literature, in teaching, of course, everything starts with education uh, differently. So the, the idea of helping each other mutually support this vulnerable and mortal existence uh, in the world surpassing little differences like um, our traditions, our clothing, our language, our background, our religion, uh, seems um, like it's a, um, like it should be a much easier thing to surpass, but the history has shown us that it was the reason used precisely to instigate violence and hate and create this discourse of other. So. This discourse has led in many cases, uh, like the country, the territory where I come from, in former Yugoslavia, to the separation of what once was one people to now different peoples and hate mobilized between those same peoples for the purposes of wars. So we are kind of witnessing that uh, same us, them vocabulary, which is always something that I believe is the role of philosophy to point out at. So philosophy, philosophers shouldn't tell people what to think, but should provide for a vocabulary that's richer, clearer, and uh, helps us understand the faultiness and the lackings of a certain vocabulary that reduces uh, our potentiality as human beings and the value of uh, other human life. Um, so that is something that I believe is the maybe most important takeaway of cosmopolitanism and the way it could be easily impl implemented. Um, what else did I want to share with you today? And um, another book, but it's unfortunately not translated into English so I, yet, so I don't know if I should write it for you. It's um, by a couple. They are both uh, well-known French philosophers, Fabienne Brugger and Guillaume Leblanc. They've written a book called The End of Hospitality. And uh, they actually give uh, concrete uh, suggestions, five of them, to thinking a way out of the situation. And um, I like to uh, quote Michel Foucault as they do in the book where he says that the role of philosophy isn't uh, to render visible something that's invisible, but precisely to make visible what is right in front of our eyes, what is so imminent, so close to us that we don't notice it. So like our own uh, suffering, like the lack of self-compassion and compassion towards others. And um, this is something that they speak about in the book. And the five uh, suggestions they elaborate are that first and foremost, we should start thinking beyond state sovereignty, um, that there are many institutions today, whether secular or religious, that uh, practice compassion and that tend towards the common good, but are not fully expressed because not supported politically by the state and um, and because of the politique sécuritaire. I don't know how to say that are uh, that's the main focus is becoming <laughs> safety and the trade-off uh, between safety and liberty <coughs> that we are willing to um, forget certain liberties in order to feel safer though again the trade-off in the social contract is going more and more towards a Hobbesian state and in, in that case so these efforts transcend, transcend the, the state bureaucracy and are aware of common humanity, shared destiny, and uh, it, it is no uh, heroic act. It's just ordinary people, ordinary politics of care, and the belief in protecting the vulnerable. Uh, maybe another interesting reference is the ethics of care, which um, were first elaborated by John Tronto and Carol Gilligan and made um, more uh, known in France by Sandra Logier and Fabienne Brugger. And the ethics of care argues precisely this, that is the care of ordinary uh, circumstances, ordinary vulnerability, that just saying that we all have equal human rights doesn't actually mean anything if there are people that are uh, more exposed uh, and more vulnerable than others. So that... Um, uh, this would constitute a common world not comprised solely in the nation state and the idea of justice that would stem from it could not be reduced therefore to the nation uh, it's supported as well by a way of thinking cosmopolitanism 
uh, as a world framework, but also as local cosmopolitanism, and that the state, uh, now this brings me back to Apia, that the state should listen and practice together the capacity of developing these solutions together. So that the state should be uh, vigilant of uh, these kinds of movements that stem from the individual, from the community, and use them to think of together, to dialogue together towards a, a, a solution. Um, the second uh, suggestion that they talk about is individual attention, which is the one I think I've already uh, made clear enough. It is thinking of the other as oneself, as uh, being vigilant towards one's own needs and vulnerabilities and equally to those of the others, deconstructing the ideas of lesser or greater value of certain lives, being attentive to that kind of language, the us and them. And the third uh, suggestion is to give credit to moral emotions, which is often in politics heard as uh, ridiculed, dismissed, that what is the role of emotions in politics or morality. But what the main role is, is that they remind us of our common humanity, regardless of some principles. Uh, there is that uh, what stems in the context in a situation that best resp uh, uh, response uh, answers to the situation. And these feelings uh, have been mobilized throughout literature, maybe most notably in Russian classics uh, like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, where they talk about often about shame for uh, a certain situation in the world. So if you today feel shame because of the inadequate response to the refugee crisis, you should just ask yourself, why do you feel shame? How is it that you are personally responsible? Well, my belief is, is that if we feel shame, it is precisely because we are citizens of the world and we feel that our belongings are no longer limited to the nation or the local, because if we did, then we would feel nothing in the face of human suffering in other parts of the world. The fourth point they talk about is changing the political thought. Um, so again, what we've touched upon, a little, I've touched upon a little bit in my talk, um, the discourse that further alienates and dehumanizes, the the one that uh, leaves refugees sleeping in the streets in the cold, uh, where should the place where we should have social workers, psychologists, uh, psychologists, people from the municipality, people trying to help pre uh, preserve that basic human dignity, but instead we have. Um, uh, discourse in media that talks about we can't provide for everyone, we don't have enough for our own, uh, providing shelter would perpet perpetuate some sort of idea of laziness, people wouldn't work, wouldn't... So we become accustomed to hear that, that political discourse, that political thought. And it's just a matter of shifting it towards reminding us of uh, our own dependencies of these same situations, that if us too one day could be stripped of our home, of our nationality, and uh, referred to as illegal, a human life as illegal, uh, then it's maybe important now to think about it through those who are actually living it um, and help preserve their human dignity. Uh, the last point, the fifth point in their book, is how to elaborate a criticism of, and now this I'll say in French because I haven't found an adequate way of putting it in English, um, so they call the state bienveillante or malveillante, mm -hmm. meaning the well-intended, the benevolent. malicious, benevolent, benevolent and then what would, be, yes. what would be the contrary? Or malevolent. Malevolent. Uh, yeah. so, that uh, a critique of a malevolent, a malicious state is uh, precisely what's needed today, the state that perpetuates this discourse, the state that only makes us think of our existence in the trade-off between security and liberty, um, talking about increased uh, threats of terror, terror, talking about perpetuating the state of emergency, all of which should be temporary. If you have uh, talked about in the semester about the state of emergency and how it should be some sort of temporary suspension of laws and never perpetuated as we've been seeing it for how long now, because the longer it, uh, per um, it lasts, the more it um, takes away from certain liberties. Um, in this trade-off between security and liberty. So critiquing uh, the, the lack of benevolence towards the other, the stranger, the lack of hospitality, and uh, practicing, again, a quote by Foucault, 
what is morality if not the practice of liberty, the deliberate practice of liberty, the exercise of one's freedom, of one's own agency. This was um, in 84, it was his last interview. And um, if we don't think about it today, and we are already facing such dire circumstances, uh, I think we should start thinking uh, through this framework and an opening out of this pessimism, out of this uh, gloomy uh, kind of dead-end situation through the spectrum of moral cosmopolitanism and uh, different kinds of belongings and imaginaries. I hope I haven't bored you too much. I hope there's some interesting questions. <laughs> Well, I have two two questions to start on the next discussion. My first question is this. You, you distinguish between tolerance, empathy, and then one other category, <coughs> which I, I forgot, and compassion. Can you elaborate on that? What, what, how, how, what are the distinctions that one operates conceptually there between tolerance, empathy, compassion, and whatever the other the third category, there was a fourth category there? Right, thank you for that question. Um, there's uh, sympathy, empathy, and compassion sympathy, sympathy. in kind of on one side because they're often misunderstood or confused for one another, and then there's tolerance. So maybe first to separate that group from tolerance. Um, in thinking uh, multiculturalism and multicultural societies, and even in some um, feminist uh, literature, there is often this um, idea of tolerance and the dangers or the benefits of it. So I use, um, use it to differentiate uh, from compassion in explaining that tolerance is, of course, uh, important, wonderful, and needed in multicultural societies, but that it's not enough and that it actually has a potentiality for conflict. And why? Um, if we only live tolerating the other, first of all, there is, again, this is something I haven't uh, touched upon, a hierarchy and the importance of trying not to think in, in, in the dichotomy of the, the one who tolerates and the tolerated. So if there is tolerance, there will always be someone who is tolerated. So who decides who is tolerated and who is not? And then tolerance also means that we just put up with something. So we live next to a stranger whose practices, traditions, affinities we don't understand, we don't try to understand, but we are just told to tolerate that. And that is a potentiality of conflict. Whereas compassion would try and work past that, again back to Apia, through dialogue that maybe isn't often an easy dialogue, that is a complicated dialogue, that is a dialogue that might be full of conflict, but again keeps us in dialogue. So as long as we're dialoguing even with our differences, it is stemming towards something. So it's uh, aiming to surpass the status quo, and that would be the main difference between tolerance and compassion. And then this might be a little bit more philosophical and maybe less interesting for international relations is the differences between sympathy, empathy, and compassion. But maybe in your daily life is an interesting thing to think about. Sympathy is just uh, the affinity to something, liking something, and empathy, a sort of shared emotion. Uh, but that often leads to, you've probably heard a lot of talk about burnout, empathetic distress. So. If empathy isn't um, um, used and uh, expressed, it can often lead to this kind of situation, whereas if it becomes a sort of action, a compassionate action, it can change, again, the status quo. And here there's a lot of interesting work done by neuroscientists, notably Tanya Singer, who had the Max Planck uh, Institute in Leipzig, who has actually shown with uh, MRIs that... Um, we can develop compassion, we can educate it. Therefore, that's why I think it's a political concept. That's why I use it in my thesis in the sense that anything that changes behavior is political. So if empathy is contingent on an upbringing of uh, having had a good enough mother, to use a vocabulary from Lacan, or uh, that period of a child's life uh, where you 
where a baby cries, all, for example, uh, witness the situation where a baby cries because somebody else uh, cried or yelled or there's some sort of tension, the baby doesn't differentiate between their body, their presence, their being, and another person's distress, and they feel in danger. That is the period of global empathy. And then there is development into empathy that understands that we are a separate individual from someone else, but if that period is accompanied properly to towards understanding that even though we are not in distress but someone else is, we should do something about it. Uh, that is something that I believe is um, dependent on childhood, on family, on education, and therefore less likely to be changed later in life. That's why I don't use the word empathy, but compassion. That is something we can use uh, and mobilize, like for example, the ways um, we often uh, nudge uh, no, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the term of nudging, like trying to change an opinion with uh, marketing or with certain ideas serve to us in a way that's not obvious. So, for example, in France, you would probably feel uh, really bad about yourself if you don't recycle, if uh, you use your car on a day where you could have used the metro and it wasn't in absolutely indispensable to take a car and we see more and more electrical vehicles, bicycles, all options like that. So that is a way of nudging towards the compassion towards the environment. And uh, I believe all sorts of nudgings of that kind are positive, but again, they are political, whereas nudging empathy is maybe a riskier, more difficult task, if that answers the question. It's useful to have those distinctions because these are concepts we use all the time. We don't distinguish them sufficiently. Uh, second question related to the first one, which is this. How do you articulate the... the you know, I mean, you have difference. You have cultural difference. You have religious difference. You have, you have uh, ethnic differentiations. You have all these different constructed differences across various kinds of uh, uh, distinctions. You have national differences, of course. How you know how how can how do you deal with this problem? You have a you have a set of foundational commitments to a cosmopolitan ethic, and you assert that I think rightly, but the, the problem is how do you actually do that? Then you assert that that the implementation of a cosmopolitan ethic does not imply and should not imply a smoothing out of a blurring of difference. That somehow we have to we have to. We have to support pluralism, even while all kinds of pluralisms, differences, even while implementing or asserting or thinking through and practicing a cosmopolitan ethic. How do you get there? How do you do that? Because it's what you know, tolerance. It's a business about tolerance, right? So there's this other community over there. You know, I don't share any of their beliefs, but I tolerate them. Whatever, huh? I'm talking about community now rather than, you know, and nations or things like that, right? I mean, people who pray in the streets. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you articulate that, that, that problem of, on the one hand, difference and pluralism and necessary pluralism, because we don't want a world state, right? And on the other hand, a cosmopolitan approach. Just tell me what you think. I, mean, I have a problem with that. I don't think there is a definite answer that could be just a one-sentence answer, but it brings me back again to Apia, and he talks about precisely this through his uh, family. It's communication. So there's things we don't understand, we will never maybe accept about the other, but it's precisely in that dialogue that we are... Um, it is the idea of the truth. So if cosmopolitanism was uh, what, for example imperialism or missionary, Christian missionaries were uh, in the sense of thinking that they have the truth, that they detain the whole truth and the right to it, and they're going to go to the rest of the world and explain what that truth is and impose it, then cosmopolitanism would be no better than that. But cosmopolitanism is precisely this idea that even if I might not persuade you today to be a cosmopolitan thinker, I might have opened a new way of thinking about the other. So uh, I know that my truth isn't the truth, that there are many truths that we should allow people to choose uh, to do the, the, their belongings and the way they live their lives. Uh, so being embedded in that local first, living that local, 
in order enables us to live uh, other attachments to to add to that local other attachments of, uh, in the future he talks about his father from I forgot the name of the village in Ghana who uh, loved uh, Cicero and English poetry but could also use the traditional language no matter how much he traveled and lived abroad in many languages he spoke of um, of the one that his grandmother, uh, his school brought him up in. So the the answer, which is not a simple answer, might be that uh, we see certain practices, like you're mentioning, people praying in the street, and it might not be our belief, but if uh, it doesn't uh, in any way endanger uh, another's existence, then that's just the difference that should be understood. And then there's the difficult part of the answer, which is often addressed well, I think, in feminist uh, theory. Like there is um, a book called Is Multiculturalism Bad for Women? Uh, the author is Susan Muller Oaken, or Mueller, I'm not sure. Oaken is the last name. And uh, it talks about. Um, like, for example, interventions being justified by liberating women in Afghanistan of yes, a certain form. Yes, we debated this. Or, so the, that's the, the, the interesting way of thinking about then what is the truth there. Who are you really liberating? Are you imposing? Are you liberating the truth? Therefore, I think there is never a definite answer, but I know that the... The cosmopolitan approach can never be mistaken in the sense that uh, interventionism, imperialism was because it knows its own fallibility. It knows that it doesn't detain the truth. It just hopes for always getting closer to better human understanding through understanding of difference. So while I'm trying to explain something to you, I might prove myself wrong and I might learn something from you. Uh, there's a, an example in um, not this book, in another book of Apias where um, a family, a, a Muslim practicing family uh, uh, is having a birthday party for their son and the son's best friend is a homosexual and he keeps saying to his best friend, I won't come to your home again until you tell your parents that I'm a homosexual, you have to tell them and the other boy says, well I can't tell my father and this goes on for a while between them and then it's the day of the birthday party and he refuses to go into the house and he stands outside, the other boy can't convince him so eventually the father comes out and he says, my wife made you these beautiful Indian dishes that you like. Come on, why are you standing outside? And he says, well, your son hasn't told you something that I have to tell you. I can't keep on coming if I don't tell you. And he says, I'm a homosexual, and I don't know how you're going to feel about that. He says, well, you know, I really enjoy my time, um, in ch uh, not in church, in, um, in at the mosque, and uh, my my readings of the Quran, but I also really enjoy your company, and you're my, friend's be uh, my son's best friend. So please come in, and that is a way of, maybe for that person, never ex expecting, uh, accepting a certain difference in a full theoretical kind of philosophical way, but accepting it uh, because that's a person he loves as a person, and that is his child's best friend. It's, a, it's an optimistic example. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much. Please, it's... <coughs> So I read that um, with Kant, he advocates for a further centralization to teach people how to behave in a cosmopolitan manner, to teach them values and how to behave. But then you say there's further democracy that's needed for having more cosmopolitanism. How do you put those together? Because if you have lots of different views going at each other, maybe it's a question you ask, but um, how do you make people behave in a certain way that also become more liberal and have more diversity of points of view? How can you compassionately impose on somebody to be compassionate? Mm -hmm. The kind of, I guess, that's <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I always use an interesting example. Is anybody Canadian? No? No, we do have a Scandinavian. Uh, no. the, uh, there's um, an interesting uh, maybe answer to that question. To me, it's always as close as I get to the answer to that, which is the Canadian identity. So it's, um, to my knowledge, uh, the best implemented identity of that being a good Canadian also being means being a good citizen of the world. And uh, that I don't see that in any way impeding the Canadian patriotism. 
So you're asking me kind of how to make, uh, how to expand that. How have we arrived to the point that when you see your flag, you get goosebumps, or when you hear your national anthem, or we have those kinds of reactions. It's all because of the social imaginary that's been mobilized. And I just believe that this other one hasn't been mobilized, and that if we were to start and try and mobilize it in the same way that national imaginaries have been mobilized, we would eventually get to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Will Kimlicka writes about the Canadian identity as that example, and that Canadians feel the need to uh, respond, to do something about when, wherever they see suffering in the world, or uh, how American teenagers when traveling alone are advised to put the Canadian flag sticker on their backpacks instead of the American because it's perceived as less offensive or less authoritarian and mm -hmm. all sorts of funny stories like that. He writes about how the um, Mossad, I believe, uh, when they traveled, they use Canadian passports mostly um, That's for secret cheating. missions. <laughs> Please. I was wondering more about a technicality. You mentioned that this is the most peaceful period. That's an often cited fact in today's day and age. As, uh, like you said, we are becoming insensitive to uh, the whole uh, influx of the media. <clears throat> but is it, I mean, I'm interested to your opinion on um, whether this is really a more peaceful period because there are fewer human deaths, or if it's becoming actually more inhumane with uh, drone strikes and, uh, I don't know, I mean, abstracting, it's no longer ground troops battling along the front lines. It's a lot more, it seems a lot more inhumane if it's possible to say that war could be more inhumane by not having humans in direct contact. No, I absolutely actually agree with that, absolutely, thanks for saying that. The, the statistical fact that there is less death from uh, wars or violent crimes doesn't necessarily mean that it's a more humane world. And I, I think that where it becomes more inhumane actually is in the alienation and the habituation to seeing violence and doing nothing about it, which even though war has existed since forever and uh, waged differently, you're mentioning drone strikes and the complete um, uh, dehumanization of the other, the, uh, making it completely impersonal. It's always been the case in war that we reduce the other to the uniform. That makes it easier to kill. If the enemy is just this uniform that represents the country, the flag, the policy of the country, whereas if you would put two uh, combatants in different sides face to face and they would both realize that they're fathers of a son or uh, like the same sports, obviously that dehumanization is gone and therefore killing is made increasingly more difficult. So. I believe that the main focus should be on precisely everything from discourse to action that leads to the dehumanization. No matter how small it seems, how nuanced, everything that leads to that is what's leading to the increased feeling of less humanity, and I, I believe that we can all feel it in our daily lives. In, uh, simple situations where you don't help somebody on the street with, I'm not even talking about a homeless person, I'm talking about somebody who dropped something or got hurt or injured, is because maybe also due to social media, the screens that are constantly filtering our reality, there's another reality that we can focus on and zoom out of the other reality. So there's a lot uh, to be analyzed about why it's becoming a more inhumane world. And I read this morning um, the New York Times, an interesting statistic that um, Actually, the main reason people don't show up for work today isn't physical illness, like a mental illness. And uh, that the highest uh, incidence of... Uh, the, the, um, the main reason of death in uh, developed countries, I think it was Scandinavia, uh, of people under 35 is suicide. So, okay, we live longer, we live better, we have uh, medicine, but... There is an alienation that I believe is uh, new to humanity and that was the reason I chose compassion for my uh, PhD because I think that uh, what is innate and original to the human and that's a, the most important book for my thesis and the book I would recommend to everyone it's uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, Emile, or On Education where he talks about how um, 
not like in the Hobbesian theory that before the social contract in the state of nature there was uh, man against man like uh, homo homini lupus est, but on the contrary that there were tendencies to help each other and that uh, man was uh, man woman, human, was prior to social contract more compassionate and that compassion has been altered by society, by ways in which uh, manifesting it has been limited, by ways in which if you act compassionately you might be ridiculed or it isn't appropriate or there isn't time for it and that all has alienated us from our nature that is uh, naturally good but altered by society. That's if one believes in human nature, of course. Yes. Which is a social concept. Yes, Isabel. And uh, building on Karen's question there, how can, uh, apart from voting, how can citizens change the government's attitudes or gender? Because you said mm -hmm. we're also becoming more implicated with this idea that there's nothing we can do because we're so jaded that we reflects that we just kind of accept things as they are. And uh, we don't question whether we can actually make a change. And uh, I'd be very curious if you could suggest um, as to how we can affect a change apart from voting. Because it seems, unfortunately, that as you mentioned, as we we're turning toward populism, we're worrying less about what we want our nations to represent or what values we want to set for, and worrying more about our own um, sustenance. So people tend to be voting more on uh, on subjects that affect them directly than, on, uh, than considering the other points in the political platforms that will affect the inside of our nations. I think it's a very difficult answer, one that I don't have a definite answer to, but uh, it's difficult to say that uh, you, everyone can do something, join a, an organization, institution, but actually it is that simp as simple as that. I, I really believe I'm probably going to cause a, a little smirk here and laugh about me being an idealist that little gestures can already lead to something like uh, going towards a stranger in the street or organizing something that will create a different climate or a dialogue like for example the case of my seminar which is in its second year and it started as the idea of the lack of humanity in uh, caregiver caretakers uh, in hospitals and not only on the patient side but also on the uh, healthcare provider side where they feel they're neglected, they have increasing demands on them and cannot uh, show their emotion and their suffering. So organizing a sort of seminar in that context with uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Hôtel Dieu, which is the oldest hospital in Paris, uh, to give, uh, give voice to that. Basically, maybe that's the answer, to give voice to a certain frustration, to a certain lacking in society in, a, in whatever way we can. If it's uh, giving voice by giving public lectures, uh, holding your state accountable if possible, that's easier said than done. Uh, joining institutions, uh, any kind of, there's always uh, less extreme and more extreme responses, like there's always revolt as the ultimate more extreme uh, manifest, manifestation demonstrations and then there's just critiquing uh, which is the role of intellectuals to uh, stand up against talk about again something that perpetuates again this discourse and to fight against it whenever we can I, the only answer I come up with and I uh, live with is to not accept uh, that as the only truth and to try and look and think past it we have to retain somehow. I mean, I, I, I you know, the idea that there, there, there's something, there's something in us as human beings that makes it, uh, makes us inherently want to struggle against injustice. Not everybody thinks this. Not everybody feels that. But you know, when you think about it, when when an injustice is committed to against you and how intensely you might feel that small injustices. Not to speak of systemic injustices like, like slavery or Jim Crow or things like that. Injustice. The, the, the idea of fighting against injustice require, requires, I think, thinking that through appropriately to move to the next step, which is say you, you fight it for what purpose? You fight it to establish justice, but then you must think clearly about what that means. What does that mean, establishing justice? 
And cosmopolitan ethics is part of the answer. I don't think it's the only answer. It is part of the answer. So I, I think there's a very deep and intimate link, which, which is not always explicit, between the, the perpetual, perpetual human struggle against injustice, against precariousness, against violence, and so on and so forth, and the need for a series of ethics that somehow transcend small group solidarities, because the only way to, to, to ultimately deal with injustice is that. That's the first step. Then you have to, there are all kinds of other things you have to do you know, in, term, in distributional terms, in economic distributional terms. But then again, you have a, you, that starts from a cosmopolitan assumption that all human beings, being of equal moral worth, deserve equal treatment. No, sorry, have the right to. Yes? We're not, in, we're not here talking about charity. We're talking about something which goes way beyond that and is much more important than that. <coughs> yes, last question. What do you, between deserve and have the right to, is there a difference or is that... Uh, well, when you, you morally deserve as a human being, but you have a right as a citizen. Yes? <clears throat> so we have to elaborate some kind of charter for not universal, not only universal human rights, but universal citizenship rights. Well, yes. the difference between have the right to and deserve, like certain countries that officially in the international sphere seem to have given human, equal human rights, but then take it away from a certain population, a certain group of people. That would make it, maybe, maybe that answers your question. But I believe that all of this starts with uh, education and media. Those are the two keys. Like We see today tendencies for different kinds of schooling. For example, if you look at the Montessori system and children educated in that, and the instances of bullying are basically non-existent versus educating kids to compete against each other, to grade them. and So there are a lot of ways of early on in childhood and in media, if you put someone on a strict diet of Fox News and CNN 24-7, uh, they're not necessarily <laughs> uh, going to be thinking in the frames that we are talking about today. So. To what extent is this a political examination of cosmopolitanism? Because I would like to know what you think of um, your, I guess, distributed polycentrism in the international sphere, and if that were achievable, and how that relates to your thoughts on human nature and um, I guess the nature of humans to want to dominate when they have power and to sustain dominance. Because in this uh, hypothetical citizenship for all humans, that would imply that, in my mind, maybe the greatest uh, hegemonic powers historically and currently would need to pay great reparations to all of the, not even nations, but the peoples they exploited and imposed their ways on. So, I mean, is there, in your mind, a, a, a realistic scenario in which um, nations with such influence would relinquish some of their power for the greater good? Or are we going to continue down this path of... Uh... I, I don't think that it could be framed in the relinquishing power or uh, paying reparations because... Um, I think that would be hardly, uh, I don't think it would be feasible. Um, it's just my personal opinion. I think if it's framed just in the sense of an addition, so it's not taking away from the current national identity or the borders, it is just opening borders, allowing for different thought. And uh, you're, you're saying about uh, pluricentral, it goes pair and pair, so pluralism, cosmopolitanism. Not in a strict sense, because there are many ways of interpreting cosmopolitanism, but just for the time being, interpreting it as a moral cosmopolitanism. So I don't think it necessarily takes away power from any state, like we see in the Canadian example, if we mobilize the idea of equal human worth and paying attention to lives that we don't give that same human worth. That's the beginning of a discussion. Yes. For an Back to the beginning. Uh, we've lost this so far. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.
Zero. We'll see you on Thursday.